Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Gary Hi. I am glad to be here and glad to be sober. Uh, I've been continuously sober in Alcoholics Anonymous since my first meeting. And that was on the longest day of the year. Nobody would pick that. June 21st, 1983. My home group is the Parker Group in Parker, Colorado. A real original name. I uh, I got there about uh, 10 years ago, and uh, it had been going on for about 42 years at that time, and I just didn't see any reason to change it. <laughs> the uh, I'd like to thank Bob and, of course, the committee, whoever those people are, for asking me to come, and you've been very hospitable. And uh, I appreciate very much the 64 pounds of groceries I've got to haul back in my suitcase. <laughs> I ain't missed a meal in a long time, as you can tell. Um, but thank you very much. It's very appreciated. And uh, this has been a very, very interesting gathering. I have had the privilege, as all of our speakers have thus far, uh, of attending a lot of these kinds of things, but this seems to sit in its own kind of category almost. Uh, you've been lambasted with the steps for going on almost 24 hours. I propose that we change it up just a bit. Just a bit. I don't ever want to forget that uh, all of the principles in Alcoholics Anonymous in effect, extend one another, the step to the tradition, to the concept, and right back. So anytime you think you're confused in AA, uh, just remember that each one of these principles is nothing more than an extension of, of that which we've already covered. It's an interesting thing for most of us that we actually have a personal experience with this stuff exactly backwards as to how we arrive at an intellectual understanding or we can say that we have taken these actions. I'm convinced today that if it wasn't for the fact that the General Service Conference was put together by Bill and Bernard Smith and some others that were very forward-thinking people, that none of us would be here. Alcoholics Anonymous would have died probably in about the early 1950s. I'm also convinced that uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I happened to stumble into a group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And those people believed in the traditions. And so I got what I believe to be the very best that Alcoholics Anonymous can give any one of us. And as a consequence of that, I believe I was afforded the opportunity to stay sober from the very beginning. I probably don't need to tell you that I didn't get here because I was a gilded lily. Uh, I was a, I was a pathetic drinker. I was a horrible drinker. I was a uh, uh, I did not drink well. Uh, I, I never did. Um, I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't even walk. I had. Um, done so much damage to my physical being, the spiritual was following right after, and I um, I was suffering every kind of way you can suffer. I didn't even want to live anymore. The thought and the prospect of facing one more day in the condition I was was un- absolutely unacceptable to me, and I didn't choose to not drink. I had no choice in the matter. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was 12-stepped into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the 12-step uh, that I think Dick is going to cover tomorrow. I believe that that is the future of Alcoholics Anonymous without it, we're dead. 
Um, I was 12 stepped by an ugly member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He had one eye relocated down low on his cheek as a result of a little conflict with a telephone pole at one point in his personal adventures. And um, we call them that. They, society calls them a blotter or an incident report. We call them personal adventures. Isn't that just wonderful? <laughs> We're also the ones that say we are above average in intelligence and earning capability. <laughs> I don't think most of society believes that. <laughs> and by the way, most of society believes in Alcoholics Anonymous. You're going to find that hard to believe. They like the results, but they are not going to beat the door down to figure out what we have. Okay. Uh, so this uh, this guy 12-stepped me. It was not a particularly good 12-step call, as it goes. Uh, I found a lot of flaws, technical and otherwise, <laughs> that I reported to him later when I could string together enough sentences to be able to form a, a reading experience with the big book. But it seems to me this guy, I had been in uh, without a drink for about eight hours at the time that he saw me. And uh, that was a critical moment for me, because it could go either way at that point. Um, he said, uh, what, what do you want to do about this here? I said, I don't think there is anything I can do. He said, let me tell you what, about this thing. And so he started telling me the story about this preaching proctologist. And a lion whacked out stock flogger, who, it seems to him discovered this thing by accident. And it seems to me today that it was a series of accidents that we ended up where we are today. And so I was, uh, I was pitched on Alcoholics Anonymous with an idea that this was put together by us. It wasn't some do-gooder. It wasn't some helper. And it wasn't United Way. It was us, and we had discovered this thing. It made no sense. It doesn't have to make any sense. That's just the way it is. And I said, well, what do you people do? He said, well, we have meetings. And in the meetings, we share experience, strength, and hope with each other that we might stay sober. I said, well, what time is this meeting? He said, meeting time is 8 o'clock. Apparently not anymore, but it, it was then. I said, well, you know, I've been in recovery for about five hours now with you. And I'm starting to what? Feel better. Right? So this was a critical juncture for me. And so he told me the first lie that he ever told me in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is, he said he'd be there at 7 to pick me up for this 8 o'clock meeting. He came early at 6. I didn't have a quite formulated plan on how to escape. <laughs> and he brought an old cop car. They bought him, you know, 150 bucks, probably making payments on him. <laughs> 1974 Plymouth Fury, I think it was, boat. And they, they, But they had newcomer locks. <laughs> And so they would they'd escort you to the meeting. And, you know, there's a, apparently something in the literature that says when you've got a live one, you better bring two people. So he brought Bubba with him. And my, my legs had quit working one more time. And so the firemen carried me to the car, locked me in the back, and drove like crazy people, listening to classical music. I'll never forget it. And they're just hammering each other up front, blah, 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 you know how it is. And they took me to this meeting. That was my first meeting. And I have been sober ever since. And I don't even know what to ascribe that to, except it had to be something outside of me because I was not capable of, of any of that. Um, I was 37 days sober, still more or less unable to function in a lot of ways. And one of them called me up and said, we're going to come by and pick you up about 2 o'clock in the morning. Where are we going? None of your business. What are we going to do? Oh, Gary, it's all about you, man. 
Well, I checked my full social calendar, and I had a vacancy. And so I, uh, I told him, sure, I'd go. He said, you may want to bring a bag. I said, all right. So anyway, we get in the car, and we go to 350 miles to a little town in northeastern Wyoming, Gillette, Wyoming. And uh, they turned me loose at a round table with two other newcomers and box cutters. And they gave us cases of big books. Cases of big books. And they said, your job is to cut covers off the books. Which I did with a flourish. And uh, there's probably some of you in the room that are wondering, why were they cutting the covers off the holy book? In those days, we didn't have a soft cover big book. So if we wanted to get a big book into a jail or a correctional facility somewhere, we had to cut the covers off. And I was a very good cover cutter. (laughs) And at the end of some four hours of this silliness, they loaded me back up in the car and off we went again, same cop car. And after about a hundred miles or so, and they're just jabbering up front, I leaned over from the back seat and said, you know what, there wasn't a thing there about me. And the one looked at the other, and, and then they looked back in the back seat, and they said, we've never seen anybody get it this fast. <laughs> so I sat back and said, well, if I can help you anymore, just let me know. <laughs> a little later on, I was... Uh, I happened to go to the meeting a little early. It was suggested to me that I go to the meeting in my home group a little early because they had a business meeting now now and again. One of them said, who's got gas in the car? And I said, excuse me, I didn't hear what he said. He said, you'll do. I said, I'll do what? He said, well, they're having an area assembly in Casper. It's about 170 miles away. We want you to go down there and represent this group. We haven't had a representative since Ike was president. And we think it's about time that we sent somebody down there and let them know that our group's doing just fine. And and you need to ask if you can just help those people. I said, I'm all about it. And they said, one of them said, well, take Mike with you. I didn't like Mike. Mike was an idiot. Mike came in after me. He was disgusting. My wine source had closed up about this time. And so uh, I took Mike to the assembly, and I got in the car, and I said, Now, look, I am on a very important mission here. (laughs) AA swings in the balance. (laughs) Don't talk to me. (laughs) And we drove. We get to Casper. I lost him in a heartbeat. I went into this gathering, much like this, more than nearly as big. I think in 1983 in Wyoming, there were maybe maybe 900 members in the whole state, and there were probably 50 groups, maybe. Assembly might have 65, 70 people there. All of them very, very interested, very interested in this thing. And I was struck by it. I mean, I absolutely was struck by it. How could these people care about this so much? The passion that I saw there, the enthusiasm, the... Um, just every part of it was great. I took copious notes, eight pages, little bitty writing. You know, there's a lot of camps in Alcoholics Anonymous. We know that today. We know we have the blah blahs and the wah wahs, and, and we have uh, yeah, everybody's got a little different spin on this thing. It seems like, and we're almost in some ways fracturing along those lines in some in some sense of the word. But there is a dispute about which probably few of you are aware. And that is the spiral notebook versus the legal pad. (laughs) If you are a spiral notebook inventory taker, you are a revisionist. They didn't have spiral notebooks in the 30s and 40s. They had big chief pads and legal pads. And no erasing in AA. Gotta have ink pens. So if you write it, you say it. Okay? You weren't even aware of that controversy, were you? 
a fountain of information. <laughs> Matters of not at all. So anyway, we load up and uh, it's come Sunday and we drive back. And I found out a little bit about general service. General service, a lot of the times you could describe it very succinctly as get in the car. <laughs> because you're going to be going to places and, you know, it helps to take a running buddy with you. So anyway, we get eight miles from town. Eight miles after clipping off 162. And Mike says, I've got to pee. I said, pinch it. <laughs> For eight miles from the house. He said, if you don't pull this thing over and let me out to pee, I'm going to pee all over your car. I did. I pulled over. He's looking for a bush. This is Wyoming. There's no bushes. <laughs> and I'm rethinking the whole gun control thing. <laughs> this time. And he gets back in the car and he says, I don't even like you. And I said, me either. He said, would you be my sponsor? That's a sick boy now, I'm telling you. So I got to know Mike. I say all that to say this. I don't think uh, I was one of these guys that uh, I was not trustworthy. I've been kicked out of the scouts. I've been kicked out of everything. Nobody wanted anything to do with me when I got sober. Nobody. And Alcoholics Anonymous took me in as I was. They didn't try to prop me up or make me into something I wasn't. They just took me as I was. They said, God, kid, you're pretty sick. We don't get them like you very often. But you can make it. I said, what's make it mean? I knew all about sobriety. I'd get sober and my life got worse. It never got better after I stopped drinking. It got worse. But I didn't have any kind of plan of action. I didn't have any kind of group to belong. I didn't, I didn't fit in this world anywhere. And it's not really much of a testament to say that you finally fit in Alcoholics Anonymous either, now that I think about it. But I'd rather be here than anywhere on the planet right now. And that's so far from where I was when I got here. So far from where I was. So... I found out about a group. I found out about how to live and everything that I know about life and living today, I found out in that group. Let's build the perfect day, a group, shall we? Why not? We're all looking for it. It would have, and let's explore a little mythology while we're at it, too. Here's one. The newcomer is the most important person in the room. Huh. How do you like that, huh? That's some kind of false humility statement that came out from somewhere. The newcomers are the lifeblood of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, who's a newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous? Okay, this is my view. My view is anybody who still thinks it's all about them is a newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous. But just my observation. So, the newcomer is the most important person in the room. Without the other people in the room, what do we have? A puddle of blood on the floor. <laughs> that blood's got to flow through something. So let's talk about the middle members. You know who you are. Five to ten, fifteen, maybe twenty years so you're impressed, nobody else is. <laughs> you're the muscle of this group that we're building. You're going to get all the heavy lifting. You're going to get the tough jobs. You're going to have to line up the greeters and sponsor them into it. Say, we shake hands, you know, and do all the things. You've got to really just lead them to water. You're, the bone or the fiber of the whole thing is going to rest on your shoulders because you're the ones that are capable of the heavy lifting. So you're the muscle. And the old timers, of course, they're the skeleton upon which this whole thing rests. So when you build the group, you build the man or the woman. And that's how you find out that you're a part of Alcoholics Anonymous, is that the only thing any of us will ever be, the highest possible position that we could ever have, is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the top shelf. It doesn't get any better than that. And that's where all of us will end up, one, one way or another. Okay. 
I was one of these that ended up falling down through the food chain. And I made myself available to whatever it was that was needed to be done. And I found out a long time ago that what I had to get in the business of was being out of the outcome business. And let God and the group and this wonderful process that we have decide whose turn it was. But I never aspired to a job ever. But I'm very concerned in Alcoholics Anonymous today because what we have is a whole group of people that are aspiring. And as soon as they get one job, they're in, they're angling for the next one. And it's like you fall down through the food chain that way. And those people are, are, uh, becoming trustees. And that is a very dangerous thing, it seems to me. And one of the things that I think that we need to do in the services of Alcoholics Anonymous is we have got to take better care of how we're selecting our trusted servants. We have a great process to do that with that attempts to remove a lot of the politicization from it, but it is not effective in removing a lot of the personality from it. And uh, we need to always remember the whole principle, or the whole basis of service is on a novel idea called trusted servants and leadership. Leaders being trusted servants, that's an oxymoron. Because in Alcoholics Anonymous, none of us have any kind of inherent capability to operate as trusted servants. We don't have that. That's not part of us. We're untrustworthy when we get here. Somebody said it earlier. They said, the God trusts you. At some point in the game, you turn a corner and God begins to trust you. How do you know? He gives you another person. He said, here, work with this guy. Don't kill him. Help him or gal. Okay? So you begin to be trusted by God. And then eventually the group trusts you to do some things, you know, make coffee. I was a new guy. I couldn't even hardly walk. They said, we think you'd make a good coffee maker. I said, are you on dope? (laughs) So they gave me the key and they gave me the, they showed me how to make coffee. But they're not stupid. They had a couple of bird dogs sitting out in the parking lot making sure I did what I was supposed to do. And I couldn't even get the key in the lock. God, they had to come and help me. It was pathetic. But they sponsored me into it. They said, here's how you fire up this Briggs and Stratton engine on this coffee maker. (laughs) Got to clean the points every once in a while. I mean, it's crazy. So... We've got this perfect AA group constructed. We've got a set of trusted servants. and I think it's a, a damn poor AA group that doesn't afford its members an opportunity to participate in general service. There's no requirement that says you have to. But it's really kind of a poor group that won't at least give you the opportunity if you're willing. In fact, if you're not willing to connect yourself to the whole of Alcoholics Anonymous... As an AA group, why don't you just drink beer in the meeting? This thing depends on an interconnectedness of the groups. And what's our MO as individuals? I know better. Hey, we got the right deal. We don't need those people. When I was a delegate, you know, 16, 17 years ago, I guess it was, I used to go around the state of Colorado to deliver this delegate's report. And everywhere I'd go, there would always be some deacon sitting there saying, what's New York do for us? And i try to be creative with some of the answers. Well, you know, and then I'd eat the little list, and i just... But it wasn't getting no traction. And I lost it in Grand Junction, Colorado. I just... The guy asked me the question, he said, what's New York do for me? We don't need New York. And I said, you know what? Good for you. Hell, you don't need New York. None of us here need New York. We're not even talking. It's not even talking about us. We're talking about the ones that are still out there, flailing away, trying to get a story. They're the ones that need New York, not us. Hell, we've done got the deal. Ain't we lucky? <coughs> I got that kind of pissed. <laughs> but I got, I got tired of trying to be creative and politically correct. Because people, alcoholics are selfish. Anybody notice that? 
And they, they have a really hard time seeing how something down the road could be helpful to somebody else. And then you find the occasional group that seems to unlock the key that uh, they're able to find a way to be uniquely useful to people. They're effective in their 12-step. They're effective in their sponsorship. And they don't want to share that with anybody. What kind of selfish crap is that? The way we stay connected in Alcoholics Anonymous as groups used to be directly through the office. When Bill used to put pins on the maps for all the groups that he had, maybe 80, maybe 100, maybe 200 AA groups. Today, we've got 55,000 in the U.S. and Canada. A lot of pins. Okay? And the way we stay connected is through a process that we agreed to through the forefathers, people that came ahead of us, that this conference process was how we were going to take the active leadership of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't say we as a trustee. I don't say we as delegates of the conference. I say we collectively, the whole of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's who's going to run this thing. Well, what happens? People feel disenfranchised. People feel like, well, those people are not listening to us. People feel estranged in so many different ways. Somebody mentioned it earlier again. We have a thing in us that tells us we're different. We have a thing that tells us that we're alone. We have a thing in us that tells us we're the only one. Okay? And without these services to connect us and hold our feet to the fire to stay the course, to take our turn in the barrel when it happens, this thing dies. Alcoholics Anonymous will live and die on its willingness and its ability to do the 12-step work of Alcoholics Anonymous and whether or not we can reinvigorate the institution of sponsorship. Because for all intents and purposes, that institution is dead. Now, I know that isn't true in this room, and I get I'm preaching to the choir. You all are great sponsors and have great sponsors, and their sponsors had great sponsors, and everybody stayed sober forever. I get that. But that's not universally true in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not universally true. And I get that uh, this crowd tonight is of like mind in most things, that you're believers in steps, and you believe in the practice of the 12 steps and of the taking of the 12 steps. I get that. And thankfully, it doesn't take so many of us to hold it together from the other two legacy standpoint. But the thing that we're seeing in Alcoholics Anonymous is all of the liberalism that happened in the 1970s and 80s, basically, has resulted in people falling down through this food chain that are now serving at the lower echelons of Alcoholics Anonymous. And let me tell you something. I've sat in meetings. I've seen this thing from the beauty at the top in the groups to the horrors in the dungeon at the bottom on the board of trustees. And let me tell you, people that are alcoholic think alike on most things. People that are not alcoholic do not think like us. They do not think like us. And that if we could get together on just about anything that was helpful at bringing this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. But when we get distracted by all of the noise that's going on about politically correct, target audiences, marketing plans, price of the book. It gets hopelessly confusing. Hopelessly confusing. So, thinking a little bit about uh, this 12-step work business. All of the services of Alcoholics Anonymous combined should end up at a focal point right underneath that 12th step. All of the services of Alcoholics Anonymous combined should do nothing but support the 12th step. Who's going to do the 12th step work? Members of groups of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's whose responsibility it is. It is our collective responsibility to do our own 12th step work. But no... We've got a better plan. Let's delegate it to some committee. Let's let this committee meddle with that. 
because, you know, it's inconvenient for me to do 12-step work. I don't want to do bridging the gap. There's a great idea. Bridging the gap. Great idea. Execution sucks. Sucks. We rely on lists of people that we don't know and that we're referring somebody to this list of people that we don't know. We don't know if they've taken the 12 steps. We don't even know if they're alcoholic or not. Who are these people? Nameless, faceless automatons. They're people who sign up on lists. They might have been sober that week. And then we, we deliver another human being onto that list. I find that very distasteful. I find that very discouraging, and I find it very difficult for me to swallow as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 step work is my responsibility. Best way to bridge the gap, go out in the parking lot and find out where these persons live. Say, well, we know somebody that lives in Anaheim. We know people that take steps. We know people. And let's get them hooked up. Somehow, some way. Great idea. Failed in execution. The 12 step is the activity that AA does. It is everything that we do should be around that 12 step. And all those services should never be the 12 step work itself. I don't need to remind this crowd of the line in chapter 7 that says, when we put this work on a service plane, the alcoholic's reliance commences to be on us rather than on God. We create wrong dependence when we have committees do work that individual members of Alcoholics Anonymous should do. We also, the ninth tradition says... We may create committees, but the real question is whether we should or not. And that is so like an alpha. Let's lay it off on somebody else. Hell, we don't, you know, we're wanting to be happy. Uh, I don't want any conflict in my life. I don't want to deal with these new people. And so then we gripe about the people that are sending people to us. I guess that's our condition. I guess that's the state of it. But the thing is, I believe this. There's more 12-step opportunity today than there's ever been, ever. And they even come to us halfway cleaned up now. Have you ever had the privilege of holding up a sick one in his own shower? I know a lot of people would never do that. I've been given that privilege. These are taking around on 12-step calls as Exhibit A. (laughs) And I know these guys were cooking up these 12-step calls. There's no way these many people were calling in. Yes, I must pick up my bed and walk with you. That was not how it was going, okay? They would take me on these 12-step calls, and they'd say, Well, Vern, if you keep drinking, you're going to look like this kid here. And Vern would go, I'm going to get young? And after about the sixth one of these, I leaned over from the back seat of the cop car and said, you're not doing this right. If you would just let me talk to them. They said, you know what? We're bringing you along here to show you what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. We hope you're taking notes. Because this is what your activity is going to be the rest of your life. Aren't you just giddy? I was not. I don't know about you, wasn't happy about that. I thought we should advance into something more meaningful. <laughs> so the group trusted me, and then I, I started taking the 12-step calls. And uh, I started going. And I started taking people with me. And um, I became a trusted servant of the group. When I got back from that first assembly, I wanted to read my eight-page really small writing report at the regular meeting. And they said, let's have the real meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous after I told them that Alex opened the meeting at 7.04 with the reading of the Serenity Prayer. Hard-hitting facts. I thought they needed to know those. And, uh, of course, we went around the table in those days, 8, 10, maybe 12 of us, if Hugh St. Lorraine showed up. And... uh, 
We had a, our group was a Damon Runyon cast of characters. We had, uh, the elder was a guy named Harry Four, the number. I had no idea what that meant. Uh, we had, uh, we had George the Banker, Ray, Plumber Ray, Fat Ernie, Benny the Mick, Insane Lorraine. She used to uh, she used to dart everywhere she went. She had one of those capes on. Remember them gals in the sixties and seventies? They wore them capes with that little fur lining on the back, and she would dart everywhere she went. And that cape would stand straight out the back of her neck, and they just followed her around. She looked like the Wicked Witch of the West, landing. And that was what your girls had to work with. She was sixteen years sober, and she was not even a fruitcake. And that was that was that great that was that perfect AA group uh, with men best there is and uh, but anyway you know we we kind of went along there and I kind of I ended up having to move to Colorado in uh, um, 1986 I'm in the oil and gas industry so I've had more down than up but uh, it was down bad in '86 so we ended up uh, moving to Colorado and. Um, I, I went to work at a, there was this club, and they were trying to have a group. There wasn't no way to group there. It was just a bunch of damn meetings. Have you noticed something strange in Alcoholics Anonymous recently? Maybe maybe not so recently. It's kind of like we've almost made going to meetings mandatory and taking the steps optional. Have you noticed that kind of sentiment that kind of pervades itself out there? When I was a delegate, I used to go ask the groups, how you doing, man? I'd see the GSR, I'd say, how you doing? And inevitably, here's the measure. They'd say, well, we have three meetings a week. Or we have, this is how much money we gave to GSR. Or, I never one time heard a group say, we cleared eight 12-step calls last week. I never heard that once. The measure of a group's health is its own ability to do its own 12-step work. And it's group sponsorship. And the group is actively involved in sponsorship because why? Most people come to Alcoholics Anonymous today come unsponsored. And so the group has primacy in that. And instead of the meeting being where we meet and discuss this thing or take it, the steps, the meeting has become where we do the 12-step work. So it's no wonder that people are showing up and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm a cross poly addicted, whatever. They don't know what they are. They're mostly liars. <laughs> they don't know. That's what AA is. Come on. It's two liars sorting out the truth. <laughs> Seems to me. But anyway, this little cast of characters in this, in this little group, and we're, we're having these, they, they, we started doing, doing things as a group, other things. We did night watch. You know, get all the, you know, Denver Central Office, they get all kind of goofy calls in the middle of the night. And so we would take a turn or two in a month, and as a group, we'd have a little potluck, have a little kind of social activity, take 12-step calls, and if somebody called in, hell, we'd go see them, two, three of us. A lot of fun. Interesting calls. You get tons of calls. We're trying to carve this group out of this club, and all they're having is meetings. Meeting, 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 meeting. Meeting makers make it. And they're just hitting them with all this kind of stuff. Okay? Has nothing to do with anything, but that was the story. So we, we, we're going along here. We're trying to get this group carved out of this thing. And it can happen. How much work are you willing to do? How much effort are you willing to give it? You can do it. Anybody can do that. So you have a real live AA group. I think with an AA group, we have a chance at sobriety. Without an AA group, they ain't none of us got a chance. None of a chance. I bet my life on that first tradition. It says that I'm supposed to set aside my own personal ambitions and designs and plans for the good of the whole, for the benefit of the many. And so then there's the one in the back that says, but if it saves just one, isn't it worth it? Not when I throw the whole group under the bus. Uh-uh. I'm not willing, I'm not willing to sell the group out to save one. Sorry. Sounds brutal, sounds cold, sounds rotten. I've watched too many die behind that stuff. Not willing to do it. In fact, I'm not willing to sell Alcoholics Anonymous out to anybody for any price. 
I am not willing to put these 12 steps up for sale. And believe me, they are. They are up for sale. So we finally get this group carved out of this mess. And we get to, we start having closed meetings in a club. How about that, huh? Try that sometime. That'll get your underwear striped. <laughs> they asked me to do some things at the area level. Chair a couple of committees. I did that. I ended up coming out of the hat as a delegate for the General Service Conference in 1993. Those were the dark days in Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of fighting going on back in New York. A lot of problems. And then uh, a little later on, became a trustee on the General Service Board. And that doesn't make me any more qualified than Frank to get up here and talk about this stuff, or any one of you. It's not because of the positions I've held, but it's the things I've seen. And my impressions of those things I've seen. And a tremendous amount of travel for and on behalf of Alcoholics Anonymous, all over the country, basically. Um, not doing the kinds of things that I think I would really enjoy doing, Rosie, that telling my story. You know, ain't much of a story, but I like the way I tell it. <laughs> and uh, I end up doing a lot of this kind of stuff. And if I sound preachy, well, I'm kind of hemorrhaging right now, so somebody can bring a tourniquet at any moment. <laughs> but I've seen a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'd like to report to you that I've seen more good than bad, but I haven't. And I, I think Alcoholics Anonymous is at a crossroads one more time in its history, in its evolution. We have a lot of uh, understanding today of our history as it really was, and not how we wanted it to be. And the great fact is that though the Rockefellers did not uh, give us any money, they put, put it into us seven other ways. Uh, any of you that are familiar with the history of Standard Oil and the Rockefellers know that they used to call them the octopus. And the reason they did was they had eight ways of getting to you. And although they never gave us any money to speak of, they populated our board on our original foundation with directors. And those directors were charged with the responsibility of husbanding us because, according to their view, we could not take care of ourselves and would not. And so they took care of us, in a manner of speaking, for a number of years. And Bill went to them during the war, during World War II, and asked them for permission to begin publishing some additional materials behind the big book. One of them was going to be a 12-step manual. Another was going to be a history of Alcoholics Anonymous for its first 10 years. Another was going to be a book that was a compendium of some of the experience of dealing with real-life situations it, Later became known, that book became known as the AA Way of Life, as Bill sees it. The board said no. The foundation board said no. They were very conservative. They followed the money, and the money was the big book, and the big book drove the ship, and nothing has changed to this day. The big book drives the ship at New York City. It drives the ship in the entirety of Alcoholics Anonymous. Sales of that item in its 13 or 14 different forms. But in the 40s, the Rockefellers had us by the throat. This thing was going nowhere quick, so Bill incorporated the grapevine to do the things that AAWS, or Works Publishing at the time, was unable to do because the foundation controlled the board. And so Bill set up the grapevine to do everything that Works Publishing could do, except it could not take member contributions. And that was his plan B. He said, if Works Publishing gets any further away from me, I'm going to move all of these books that I want to write over the great and they're going to publish them, and we're going to get out of this mess. And that didn't happen. A guy by the name of Bernard Smith, who was not hooked into the Rockefeller, showed up at a board meeting one time, and somebody said, you need to come in here and see this. This is pretty interesting stuff. He went in there and he was captivated. Bill happened to be in the meeting at the time. He saw that Byrne had no connection with the Rockefellers. And he glommed on him like, stink on you know what. And he was able to sit down with Byrne and explain the dilemma that faced Alcoholics Anonymous in the mid-1940s. 
and that is that the foundation trustees wanted nothing to do with the groups. They wanted nothing to do with the fellowship. They wanted nothing to do with the office. They wanted nothing to do with anything except pedal that book. Pedal that book. Pedal that book. And Bill felt that the trustees and anybody that served us in Alcoholics Anonymous ought to come from us and ought to be able to go out and see us where we were because they were one of us. He was so concerned about us and them, us and them, us and them. He was so concerned about it. He knew that this board was going to have to be populated by alcoholics. And the original experiments of having alcoholics serve on the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous were failures. The first two chairmen of the board of AA or of Works Publishing was uh, both of them got drunk. And so that was not a good experience curve with this stuff. But Bill, you will never find in the history of mankind before or after this moment a greater champion of the alcoholic than Bill Wilson. He believed in us. He believed that we would do the right thing for the alcoholics because we were alcoholics. That's why he believed that. And he had complete faith in us. So, he was able, with Burnsmith's help, to become and to frame this general service conference. Had to get it away from the foundation. Had to get it away from it. And the foundation was not happy. They did not sing the group song, Kumbaya. They did not wave the lighters. They were not happy. They were losing control of this thing. And so Bill had to make some deals. One of the deals was that there would always be a majority of non-alcoholic trustees on the board. And that was changed finally, I think, as a kind of a mercy vote to Bill in 1968, shortly before he died. And I don't mean to bore you with a lot of the details of the background or all the smoke behind this thing. I'm just telling you that A comes of age is the definitive document for the history of Alcoholics Anonymous in its first quarter century. But I'm going to also share this with you. It is the way cleaned up version of the truth. Like in the 12 and 12, do you really think Bill went up and told the Irishman, well, I think you're just an egotistic Irishman who's trying to run the whole show. Do you think that's really what he said on that bed? I don't think so. I think it was a little coarser, perhaps. Something like Frank would deliver. (laughs) Or others. (laughs) Yeah, see... Bill wanted to always make sure that the picture that got painted about us and for us was the best possible posture and picture that we could have. That's what he wanted for us. And so things evolved. The conference was launched in 1950 at Cleveland. Did any of you ever hear how we adopted the traditions? You know how we adopted the traditions in Cleveland? First of all, who could vote? We didn't have any service structure. There was no GSRs. There were no districts. There were no areas. There was none of that. If you were at Cleveland and could mobilize your arm, you could vote. So here's how the presentation went for the traditions, the adoption of the traditions in 1915. I offer before this body the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous points designed to ensure our future. Seeing no objection, I move that they be adopted unanimously. That's what he said. And everybody said, what did you say? They said, I don't know, it's good. And they all stood up and clapped. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Doesn't that sound like Bill? Sound like something you'd like to think of, too, doesn't it? (laughs) And so this this thing just kind of evolved along. Big book sales, the 1940s were 15,000, 10,000, 12,000 a year. Uh, in 1950s, they started going up to about 20,000, 22,000 maybe a year. 1968. What happened in 1968 besides Frank got shot? But then what? What happened in 1968 was a thing called the Hughes Bill. One of our illustrious members, who happened to be a senator, state of Iowa, decided he'd author a bill. 
say, we're going to get the alcoholics off the street. We're going to put them in, and we're going to give them treatment. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's wonderful. Everybody sing the song. And so they authorized the Hugh Bill, and that created the treatment industry that we kind of know about today. I don't say any of that to talk about outside stuff, because treatment really is an outside issue. The point I'm trying to make is, what was its net effect on Alcoholics Anonymous? By 1970, the numbers of groups that began to ramp up, the numbers of big book sales, the numbers of pamphlets that we were distributing, the numbers of pamphlets that we, we were creating, all began to increase exponentially. Nothing like the 5 to 7 to 10 percent growth that we'd experienced all through the 40s and 50s as a direct result of direct 12-step work. We started ramping up exponential growth, sometimes as high as 20 percent a year by every measure, by every measure. And Alcoholics Anonymous was totally unprepared to handle that kind of growth, could not handle it. The service structure was in its infancy, couldn't adapt quick enough to provide the services that were necessary for the groups to do their own 12-step work. So what happened in that time was the groups and the members got conditioned to having people come in bus loads. They no longer had to go out and find the alcoholics where they were. They were coming to them. And they were drinking all the coffee, not leaving any money, and resentments began to brew. And this started early, early on. Early on. And later, later on, uh, it started uh, growing again exponentially in the 80s. Because it was really the only game in town. It was the only, quote, anonymous fellowship that there was. When I was on the board, we gave uh, a fellowship called Seniors Anonymous. I don't know how you slip. <laughs> <laughs> Authorization to use our 12 steps and our 12 traditions. Uh, that was the 228th anonymi that the board has issued approval. I didn't think there were that many things wrong with people, but uh, apparently there are. And so uh, all of this stuff started happening, but these other fellowships were in their infancy, and they were not, they were not actively, proactively 12-stepping either. So it became a dumping ground for all of these ills of mankind. And, you know, it's, a, it's all the same. And all that mentality started to permeate itself throughout the fellowship. But AA stopped growing in 1990. By every measure, 55,000 groups in the U.S. and Canada in 1990, 55,000 and change in 2006. 1.1 million members U.S. and Canada, 1.1 million members in 2006. 16, 17 years go by, and we're flat by that measure. But what happened in the interim is groups began to disappear and meetings began to take on more and more and more importance. Now why that happened, you can, you can speculate amongst yourself. The whole point of the fact is that it did happen. And so our ability to track and measure and monitor by those standards has been seriously impaired. So let's throw the baby out with the bathwater, which we did. Let's just track big book sales. Big book sales are in decline. Had it not been for the spike created by the fourth edition in uh, 1999, we'd probably be selling around 600,000 copies a year. That's considerably less than we sold in the peak, which was about 1.1 million copies a year. All right, all you statisticians out there, let's just smooth the curve. And let's just say, okay, maybe we should only been selling 600,000. Great. How many big books do you have in your bathroom? I got at least a dozen of those suckers sitting around the house. I bet you everyone in here's got more than one. So see, this is a captive audience here, and this is where these things are going. They're going off, they're going in the house. Alcoholics Anonymous has been on the literature kit forever, forever, and we're still there. And we ain't getting weaned. Lately, they just uh, jacked the price of the book up $2 a pop. How do you like that? It didn't impress me. I believe that it ought to be going the other way. I think that that literature ought to be published at cost, but it will not happen until and unless the groups support the services. And what we're talking about support, we're not talking just about money. 
We have got to start sending people back to that conference in New York and Jeff, and there's other past delegates around, I know there are, that are willing to sit and ask the hard questions. Why are we doing this? This is a horrible waste of money. We need to take care of our business at the highest possible level. We need to stop usurping the obligations of the group down the food chain, and the groups have got to stop abdicating it. Stop throwing it out. Take care of our business in the group. The group is the spiritual entity in Alcoholics Anonymous. It says so in the fifth tradition. If you don't believe it, read it. It says each group ought to be a spiritual entity having but one primary purpose. Okay? But a group does not do just meetings. That's not the only thing a group does. A spiritual entity. What does that look like to you in a picture? To me, it looks like a 168-hour-a-week operation. There's no days off. There's no paid holidays or 401ks in that thing. It's a group. And that's the vehicle by which we've decided we're going to operate. I don't think it happened on purpose. I think it happened by accident. Personally, I only believe there's only one AA group in the world, and that's AA as a whole. But because AA does not work well at that level, we have to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in order to be more and more and more effective. Two liars sorting out the truth. Not 60. Nobody's telling the truth. You got that many around. And where, where is everybody? Did, how about the little meeting that's over there at Whistle Drifters Club? That they got 80 new people there and they got two old veterans just getting hammered. They're outnumbered. They're not going to make it. Who do you think is going to have their way in that meeting? And to the people that attend that meeting, that looks like Alcoholics Anonymous to me. The people that end up in a group of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what it's going to end up looking like to them. I think the ones that end up in a group are going to end up with a better chance. And we have to, we have to talk about these things that are not so easy to talk about, and we have to face these things that are not so easy to face as an entire fellowship. Because if we don't, we're hung. The goose is cooked. I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous was ever intended to be huge. I don't think it was ever intended to get them all. It never will. But it'll get its fair share. And I'm as concerned as you are with the people that are leaving out the back door as many as are coming in the front door. What are we doing that's, uh, that's not uh, helping our members find some satisfaction in conducting 12 step work? Maybe we're losing people we should lose. I don't want to be the one that's making that call. I don't think that's my job. The, the situation with AA worldwide is that there are, there are many places that Alcoholics Anonymous does not exist. The General Service Office has been tasked with the, with the responsibility of coming up with all the translations worldwide. I would agree with those of you that are concerned about that from the standpoint that it is all about the copyrights, international copyrights. I get all that. But I do think the General Service Office, through your group contributions, can make a meaningful, helpful approach to the business of carrying this thing in 52 languages now and probably four more in the can. Um, and we, we're in 130-some-odd countries. I think it was mentioned earlier today. And I think that's important stuff to know. And everybody likes hearing the stories of, you know, we went to Mongolia and sat in the yurt and we meditated and had a kumbaya experience and all that. Okay, that's great stuff. But I can tell you right in our backyard, right in our backyard, there are people dying all around us that have never had an opportunity to see or find out what we have had the privilege of finding out in Alcoholics Anonymous. 1996, after uh, I was a delegate, a friend of mine bought an old junky oil field in Louisiana, which is like going to outer space, and said, would you uh, go down there and look at this thing and see what it's going to take to run it? And I said, all right. So I went down there and didn't have to stay there very long, and I realized I was going to have to move down there. And my roots in Alcoholics Anonymous are tapped heavy in Colorado. People I sponsor and sponsored. Uh, Colorado is where I live. It's where I get my mail. 
But I ended up having to go down there. And I ended up in a town of 3,500 people on Saturday night, eight bars and no AA. They drink and, dr drink and wet and boat and dry. And so uh, I did the things that Chapter 7 suggests that we do. I went to all the jails, went to all the preachers, went to all this, trying to find alcoholics to 12-step. Uh, and I was able to get four 12-step calls from bartenders. thought it was a good CPC idea myself, but... <laughs> these are these are people that I, I would just go to there and I, I would sit there and eat whatever roadkill they had that day for lunch and uh, they they say we noticed you're not drinking they say yep I, well what's the deal I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous at first they thought I was in the temperance union and uh, then I said you know you probably got somebody you don't really want their business and they said yeah we've got a bunch of them I said well if they ever indicate any desire at all to stop drinking and then call me. And I got four 12-step calls from this one bartender. He was amazed. Two of them cats got sober. And so we started a little group. And the way we started this group was the way we you start any kind of AA group. We teed it off and uh, let them hammer away. And uh, these guys became step working fools. And one of the deals in being in that group was the whole group had to go to the district meeting. We'd load up in a couple of cars and drive over to Lake Charles, Louisiana on second Wednesday, I guess it was. And we'd, we'd attend the whole the district meeting as a, as a whole group. Now, it took them three meetings to figure out that they could elect one of them to go. <laughs> They're not real quick. And I didn't put it out there. I just said, well, let's go. It's Wednesday. We've got to go to the district. All right. And they just bubbled right along, you know. One of them said, well, let's elect somebody. He said, we can do it right here on the court, on the steps. So they did. They elected Dexter. Dexter was the first year I saw but Dexter had come with somebody else, so we all had to stay anyway. But uh, we let him we let him weigh in when he, when he got back from that first district meeting, went to him on his own to get a little report. You should have seen those cats' eyes, those boys and girls. You should have seen their eyes. They realized they belonged to something that was far greater than they had any idea. We were talking about it at that time. I don't remember. They were going to rewrite some pamphlet, and they were having a big fight. And they all got involved. And I thought, what a wonderful thing to watch this, to be a part of this small piece of it, and let them, let them float away. Um, that was a lot of years ago. And uh, i got to tell you, I've been around, I've had a lot of privileges in Alcoholics Anonymous, seen a lot of things, but I never felt as alive in Alcoholics Anonymous as I did those two years I was down there. I knew that every move I made counted for something, and I knew that I had a big old bullseye on my back. See, I'm, I was in southwest Louisiana, and the family trees don't fork there. <laughs> and I, I didn't drink there. They didn't know me from Adam. But they knew these first two cats that got sober, and they, everybody gave up on them. And these guys got sober and stayed sober. So something was going on. Had, it, had that never happened, nothing would have ever happened. And so... All of that counted for something, and I, I knew at that time that I was going to need every experience I'd ever had in my life in Alcoholics Anonymous just to stay afloat, just to stay afloat. And eventually I was accepted down there, and uh, we had a great group for, for the time that we were there, and it continued to be for a number of years, and uh, Rita pretty well wiped it out, the storm. I wonder why they named storms after gals. Anybody want to start a new inventory? <laughs> so, okay, so so all of that happened. I had a I had an opportunity to uh, sit down and talk with uh, a guy in the Boot Hill of Missouri. This is on one of these little adventures that I had as a trustee. I loved getting out and seeing the people where they were at, watching them how they were doing things. Uh, a friend of mine who was a delegate from Eastern Missouri called me. He said, you like getting out to the groups? I said, more than anything, more than anything. He said, let's take a three-day road trip. We'll do a whistle stop, and we'll just drop in on them. So I thought, well, that'd be cool. I'll bring an old file folder, and we'll tell them we're from headquarters. <laughs> and we've got a whole file full of incident reports. We want to find out just what the hell's going on here. So we did. 
oh, God, we have way too much fun, too. We showed up at this one group at 6 o'clock in the morning. There were three people sitting there, all of them for more than 10 years. And they were arguing about some kind of, I don't know, some kind of unrelated matter. And we dropped in there and said, we're from headquarters. We have these incident reports here. And one of the guys looked at the other guy and he said, God damn it, Bill, I told you we shouldn't have done that. (laughs) Way too much fun. I about wet myself. (laughs) And we just did that for two or three days. And I'll tell you, then Mike, uh, my delegate host, sponsor, I guess you'd call him, he took me to a guy's house in the very southeastern corner of the state, uh, Leon McGarry was his name. And uh, this old man, he, he, he received me. We went down into his man cave, which is a shrine to Alcoholics Anonymous. And we sat there and we talked and visited. And he told me a little bit about his story. He'd come to that area in 1947 and sobered up, helped start AA there. And then he produced a letter from Bill as a result of him meeting him in Cleveland in 1950. And said, uh, Mr. McGarity, paraphrasing, and the letter was dated, I believe, 1951. Mr. McGarity, I can tell you how appreciative we are of the fact that we were able to meet. I appreciate your efforts on behalf of Alcoholics Anonymous in the southeastern corner of the state of Louisiana, or uh, Missouri. He said, um, it is my greatest hope that one day one of our trustees would be able to come and see you where you are and to greet you and thank you personally. And I looked at that letter and I looked at him and he was crying. And he said, I got this letter in 1951. It's 2007. It's about time. <laughs> and that was an unintended deal. That wasn't supposed to happen. That was just one of the little joys in the journey, you know, we got. And I was just, I got home, and I, I thought, I need to send him some acknowledgement of this. Uh, I am not a trustee. What you see before you is not a trustee. I served you as a trustee. One look at me would tell you, you don't want my kind of cat in New York City. I ain't wired right for that deal. I'm not. But I believe in the groups. I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe in all of our principles. And I believe in our execution of those principles to the best possible standard that we can have. And I am so sick and tired of selling this thing down for good. Yeah, we do a lot of good things. And the good is going to kill us. Because if it ain't the best and if it ain't top shelf, in my mind, it's not alcoholics at all. It is the best there is. So because of the fact that you asked me to do this for you, and because of the fact that I know in my heart of hearts that you trust me, I sent a letter back to Mr. Leon, and I said, Leon, on behalf of the General Service Board, on behalf of alcoholics everywhere, those that are here, those that have gone before, and those that are yet to come. I want to thank you personally for your sacrifice, for your labor, and for your love of this fellowship. Same to you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.